thank you very much. Uh, I suppose the second uh, greatest pleasure in the world is to uh, be present when one of your former students and colleagues receives an award. Uh, but the first greatest pleasure must be uh, something I'm still waiting for when one of my children or grandchildren gets an award. And then there's the third. Uh, when I'm scheduled to give a talk somewhere, I naturally try to find out something about the audience and their special interests uh, and concerns. It's not very hard to figure it out from where I'm standing. Uh, actually, I had, fortunately for me, I had some outside assistance in this case. Uh, my grandson, who's planning to play for the Boston Celtics when he graduates from college, uh, kept me up to speed on the great events at the University of Connecticut this year, and uh, even got me to take him to a Celtics game. First time I'd done that in 50 years. Uh, it was a lot of fun, also an educational experience for him in another area that interests me. Uh, in the final minute, uh, a Celtics star made a game-winning basket, but the referee called a foul uh, wrongly. My grandson and 18,000 other people uh, insisted rather vociferously. Uh, the next day, he carefully crossed out all the errors in the Boston Globe, uh, and he learned that you can't trust the media. The Celtics really won by a point, so starting early. Actually, I thought I might use this occasion to put in a good word for him uh, for an athletic scholarship uh, 10 years from now, uh, but uh, I suppose that wouldn't be fair. Uh, well, there's no really natural transition to the topic that I would like to say a few words about, and that is the prospects uh, for the study of the mind and the brain uh, in the coming years, uh, a topic that many feel to be the last great mountain range that the natural sciences might hope to scale. Uh, actually, there is a kind of transition. Uh, shooting a basket and understanding a sentence uh, seem to share some fundamental properties. Uh, that matters discussed in the literature very well in a forthcoming technical paper by one of the leading researchers in cognitive neuroscience, uh, Randy Gallistel. Uh, he argues pretty convincingly, I think, that a very long tradition, centuries-old tradition, of research and speculation into mind and brain uh, is very far off the mark in uh, the way it conceives these topics uh, on the basis of generalized learning processes, associative theories of learning, and so on. Uh, rather, he argues that throughout zoology and experimental psychology, it's increasingly becoming clear that the mechanisms of learning are, in his words, computationally specialized for solving particular problems. And that's true from insect behavior to shooting the winning basket for the Celtics, uh, to what you and I are doing right now. Uh, he also points out that this uh, so-called modular view of learning is the norm these days in the neurosciences. So according to this view, all animal learning is based on specialized mechanisms, uh, what he calls instincts to learn in specific ways. These learning mechanisms can be thought of as organs within the brain, uh, which are neural circuits uh, whose structure enables them to perform one particular kind of computation, something that they do reflexively uh, apart from extremely hostile environments. Uh, human language acquisition, topic that particularly interests me, uh, is instinctive uh, in very much this sense, based on a specialized language organ which grows in every person from an initial state, which is an expression of the genes, right through several stages until it finally reaches uh, a mature state uh, that corresponds in some rough sense to what we informally call a language, say some variety of English. And this transition does appear to take place as virtually a reflex, uh, apart from extremely hostile environments. In fact, it seems that 
normal knowledge of language, something can be very closely approximated, uh, even by the deafblind. Uh, that is, people who are using only the extremely rudimentary information that's provided by placing a hand on the face of a person who's speaking. Full story is somewhat more complex, but that's a remarkable indication of how the organ works reflexively in very hostile environments. Well, as I mentioned, these are the specific topics of um, cognitive psychology that have been of particular interest to me over many years. And I think that the uh, work of the past half century, including quite groundbreaking work that's been done right here, uh, very strongly supports the general thesis that is now the norm in neuroscience, namely that thinking and learning involve specialized organs of the brain. If that turns out to be true, then the brain will be very much like the rest of the organism, which functions through the interactions of highly specialized subsystems. So the circulatory system, the digestive system, the visual system, the kidney, and so on. Uh, these are often called organs of the body, but of course not with the implication that you can cut them out and leave the rest intact. Uh, rather, they are subsystems of a complex whole uh, with their own specialized properties intersecting in specific ways. Organs in an abstract sense, but a sensible one. And there seems to be every reason to believe that the human brain is structured along the same lines. Well, Gallistel also sounds a useful warning note, and I want to talk some about that. Uh, he points out that we clearly do not understand how the nervous system computes, even how it carries out the small set of arithmetic and logical operations that are fundamental to any computation. That goes all the way down to insects. Uh, a great deal has been learned about several of the organs that enter into human thought and action, and the language organ is a particularly striking case, but there are enormous gaps of understanding. Uh, one of them is the gap between theories of the nature and the growth and the use of the organ uh, and the theories of the anatomy and physiology of the brain. Uh, it's for such reasons that the organs that enter into thought and action are often called mental organs. Uh, it's to signal that the problem of unification remains very far from resolution. That means the problem of bringing together in some fashion uh, theories of mental aspects of the world and other aspects. Uh, in this case, we presume cellular aspects. Well, that problem arises all across, uh, across all psychological problems, down to simple animals. Uh, and it shows up in many ways. So, for example, a great deal has been learned about vision in recent years. But as another prominent neuroscientist really recently pointed out, uh, the ability to recognize a continuous vertical line is a mystery that neurology has not yet solved. Actually, that word, yet, uh, should sound another warning note. Uh, no one knows how long yet will be uh, and what might be necessary even for this problem to be solved, uh, let alone uh, what changes might be necessary in basic fundamental science uh, if there's going to be any hope of relating mental aspects of the world to others. Well, there are many leading figures in the brain and the cognitive sciences who are quite optimistic about the prospects, but not without recognizing the gaps that remain. Actually, chasms might be a better word. Uh, one of the grand old men, men of the field, uh, Vernon Mountcastle at Johns Hopkins, who happens to be one of the optimists, uh, he points out that the study of higher mental faculties raises a very serious question about the validity of the long-standing dogma of neuroscience that neuron cell types and their biochemical mechanisms are strongly conserved in mammalian evolution. And that evolution uh, dogma, he says, is challenged seriously when it's applied to the human brain, which appears to have neuron types that differ from those of any other mammal uh, in biochemical mechanisms and in patterns of uh, interaction and connectivity. And still more serious is something that he doesn't mention, namely that we don't even know that those are the right mechanisms and patterns to explore. 
in seeking to achieve unification of mental and cellular theories of the world. Well, it's now assumed that the human species reached essentially its current state about 100,000 years ago. That was after very radical changes in the preceding several million years. Uh, those changes uh, included a tripling of brain size uh, and a great many structural changes, which are very poorly understood, uh, long after the separation from the nearest surviving relatives, so something on the order of five to seven million years ago, which means the separation of twice that length in evolutionary terms. Uh, it's also assumed, plausibly, that whatever happened about 100,000 years ago probably involved the uh, appearance of a language organ, and with it, presumably, many of the other distinctive properties of our quite curious species. Well, that's just a flick of an eye in evolutionary terms. Uh, also intriguing, and I think increasingly clear, is the apparent biological isolation of these faculties, especially the human language faculty. Perhaps the closest analog to that is in insects, the famous dance of the honeybees. But there's quite a lot of controversy about the nature and function of those systems, and the analogies are at best very weak, and there's obviously no evolutionary connection. Uh, the basic facts were pointed out by Darwin, who noted the radical distinction between human language and all known animal systems of communication. Uh, human language, he pointed out, is infinite in its capacity for expression of thought, while other animals crucially lack that property, and as we now know, uh, many other elementary properties of human language as well. Uh, the observation is actually far older. Uh, it was pointed out by Galileo, became a central part of the great scientific revolution of the 17th century, which constructed our contemporary worldview in essence, uh, and which also included uh, uh, a cognitive revolution, the first great cognitive revolution, maybe the only one that really merits that term. Well, as we all know, this 17th century revolution reached its highest peak in the achievements of Isaac Newton. It's quite commonly held that Newton showed that the universe is an intricate mechanism, kind of like uh, the complex automata that captured the imagination of 17th and 18th century thinkers just pretty much the way computers do today. Uh, but in fact, what Newton demonstrated was the exact opposite, uh, and it's important to understand that. Uh, what Newton showed, greatly to his dismay, is that the universe is not a mechanical device. So to quote a leading contemporary historian of physics, uh, Newton showed that a purely materialistic or mechanistic physics is impossible uh, he showed that it is necessary to introduce into the core natural sciences incomprehensible and inexplicable facts. Uh, Newton understood that, and he regarded his own conclusions as what he called an absurdity, spent the rest of his life trying to find some way to escape them, as did many other leading scientists, in fact, for centuries, but in vain. Uh, Nowadays, it's common to ridicule those who still believe in what's called the ghost in the machine, you know, the mind and the mechanical body. But that criticism seriously mistakes the problem. Uh, Newton exorcised the machine. He left the ghost completely intact. Uh, that fact was well understood. It was understood by leading figures. So 250 years ago, uh, David Hume pointed out accurately, that Newton seemed to draw the veil from some of the mysteries of nature, but he showed at the same time the imperfections of mechanical science and thereby restored nature's ultimate secrets to that obscurity in which they ever did and ever will remain. Uh, Newton showed on that, to his dismay that the world is simply not comprehensible to human intelligence at least in the ways that uh, early modern science uh, had hoped and expected. There's a classic scholarly study of the history of all these topics, uh, which describes Newton's achievements as the destruction of materialism or physicalism, the idea that the world is a machine. 
Uh, he reviews how the expectations and the goals of the pioneers of the scientific revolution and their predecessors were abandoned, and we gradually accustomed ourselves to the abstract notion of forces, or rather to a notion hovering in a mystic obscurity between abstraction and concrete con comprehension. Uh, it's a turning point, he says, in the history of materialism that removed the doctrine very far from that of the 17th century and before, and in fact deprives it of any significance. Uh, well, these facts have considerable bearing on the study of the mind and the brain today. Uh, in the light of Newton's demolition of the concept of matter, of mechanical universe, uh, many scientists came to recognize uh, that John Locke, around the same time, uh, must have been correct in suggesting that just as the world has properties of attraction and repulsion and others that we can in no way conceive motion able to produce, so a faculty of thinking might have been superadded to matter. Uh, the term matter by then had lost any significance. It refers merely to the world with whatever strange properties it has, including Newtonian absurdities and much more extreme ones that had to be accepted as true in later years. Uh, by the end of uh, the 18th century, uh, Locke's tentative suggestion was rephrased by the famous chemist Joseph Priestley as a virtual truism, uh, namely the powers of sensation or perception and thought are properties of a certain organized system of matter, properties termed mental, are the result of the organical structure of the brain and the human nervous system generally. That's not a substantive thesis, it's just a truism, there's nothing else. Uh, Priestley, of course, had no idea how these properties arise from the nervous system, uh, nor do we. Uh, rather, like the properties of attraction, uh, repulsion, chemical affinity, light, uh, electricity, and magnetism, and many others, uh, mental properties just have to be postulated on the basis of experimental evidence. There may be a hope for eventual unification, but there can't be any prior idea of the form that it might take if it ever happens. Well, today, that, that, that traditional and virtually inevitable conclusion uh, has been revived without much awareness of its uh, history. Now it's reformulated as a major thesis of contemporary uh, neuroscience. So quoting Vernon Mountcastle again, it's the thesis that things mental, indeed minds, are emergent properties of brains, though we do not yet understand the principles that relate these emergent properties to those of cells. That's the 18th century thesis, and the word yet again reflects the prevailing optimism, which might be right or might be wrong. But whatever speculations one may have about the prospects, the thesis isn't new, the thesis is a traditional one, and in fact a direct consequence of Newton's exorcism of the machine. Actually, the history of chemistry provides very revealing lessons for the study of mind, mental aspects of the world, and the course that it might take. A chemistry, of course, is hard science. That's right next door to core physics and the rather misleading standard hierarchy of reducibility. Uh, by the mid-18th century, it was already understood, I'll quote a leading English chemist, understood that chemical affinity uh, whatever makes chemical reactions work, must be accepted as a first principle, which we cannot explain any more than Newton could explain gravitation, and let us defer accounting for the laws of affinity, laws of chemistry, until we have established such a body of doctrine as Newton has established concerning the laws of gravitation. And that, in fact, is what happened. So chemistry proceeded to establish a rich body of doctrine uh, quote a contemporary historian of chemistry, its triumphs were built on no reductionist foundation, but rather achieved in isolation from the newly emerging science of physics. And that, in fact, continued until very recently, actually until the time when I was in school, which doesn't seem so long ago to me at least. Uh, what was 
finally achieved 60 years ago by Linus Pauling was not reduction. Important to understand that it was unification, quite different. A few years earlier, in 1929, uh, Bertrand Russell, who knew the sciences quite well, uh, observed that chemical laws cannot, cannot at present be reduced to physical laws. Uh, but his phrase, cannot at present, was shown to be wrong. It turned out that chemical laws cannot in principle be reduced to physical laws as physical laws were understood. Uh, physics had to undergo radical changes, mainly in the 1920s, uh, in order to be unified with basic chemistry. Physics had to free itself from intuitive pictures and give up the hope of visualizing the world, as Heisenberg put it. It's another long leap away from intelligibility in the sense of the scientific revolution of the 17th century. Well, as recently as 70 years ago, before the unification was achieved, chemistry was regarded by prominent scientists as just a calculating device, that is a way of organizing and predicting the results of experiments, but without any reality, because it had not been reduced to core physics. And that topic was hotly debated in terms which are very similar to the debates that dominate much of contemporary thinking uh, and about um, cognitive psychology, philosophy of mind, mind and brain. By the 1930s, it was understood that that debate had been totally pointless. Uh, it was understood that chemistry was real in the only sense of reality that we have. It was the best theory that could be constructed uh, to understand chemical aspects of the world, and we can do no better than that. These quite recent developments in the core natural sciences should, I think, be taken very seriously in considering higher mental faculties and the bodies of doctrine that are being developed concerning them, language in particular. Uh, a few years later, uh, there was a unification of biology and chemistry with the discovery of DNA. Uh, but that can be misleading. That was, in fact, genuine reduction, but to a newly created physical chemistry. In fact, some of the same people were involved, notably Pauling himself. Uh, true reduction is not all that common in the history of science and it need not be assumed automatically to be a model of what will happen in the future as we approach this last frontier, the human mind. Uh, the study of human higher mental faculties might well follow the course of the investigation of mechanical and electromagnetic and optical and chemical aspects of the world. That is, the hope for reduction may once again prove illusory, as it's been very often. Uh, you cannot know until we finally know, if we ever do, uh, how unification might take place and what form it will take. Uh, perhaps once again, a radical reconstruction of what's misleadingly called the more basic science. Uh, in the last half century, there has been intensive, often highly productive inquiry into the brain, uh, behavior, uh, mental faculties, cognitive faculties of many organisms. And the holy grail, of course, is human higher mental faculties. But it should be clear that this is the goal that is likely to be the most remote, possibly very likely by orders of magnitude, uh, for one reason, because of the complexity of the systems and their apparent novelty and biological isolation. Uh, another serious barrier to inquiry is that direct experimentation is excluded on ethical grounds. I should add, today it's excluded. Uh, not very long ago, practices were quite different in ways that we would now find extremely shocking. Uh, a lot is known about the visual system of humans, but that's on an assumption, on the assumption that it's rather like that of other mammals, including other primates. And for these animals, we permit ourselves uh, invasive experimentation, uh, raising animals in controlled environments, putting electrodes into their brains, and so on. And from such experimentation, a good deal is learned, and the basic conclusions are rather reasonably assumed to hold for the human visual system. But we know of no analogs to language and other higher mental faculties. Uh, and if we discovered some organism that had similar mental organs, we would presumably bar direct experimentation 
as we do for humans. Now, there is hope that new non-invasive technologies like, say, brain imaging may offer a way around this barrier to understanding, and the prospects for that are exciting and a lot has already been learned, but despite important progress and excitement generated by the newer technologies, I think it's quite wise to be cautious in assessing what we know and what we might realistically hope to learn. For the present, the study of language and other higher human mental faculties is proceeding very much the way chemistry did throughout its history, seeking to establish a rich body of doctrine, sometimes succeeding with an eye to eventual unification, but without any clear idea of how this might take place. Uh, some of these bodies of doctrine are actually rather surprising in their implications. So in the study of language, for example, very recent work, some of the most important of it conducted right here, uh, is providing interesting grounds for taking seriously an idea that a few years ago would have seemed quite outlandish, uh, namely that the language organ of the brain approaches a kind of optimal design. That is, that it is in some interesting sense an optimal solution to the minimal design specifications that the language organ must meet to be usable at all. Now, that's not at all what one expects to find in a highly complex biological organ. Uh, you do expect to find it and do find it at the very simplest level, say, study of cell division or the structure of viruses. Uh, but it's been commonly assumed that evolution is uh, a tinkerer, in the phrase of Nobel laureate François Jacob, uh, evolution sort of does the best with the materials at hand, and the best turns out to be rather messy and convoluted. Uh, if a very recent emergent organ that is central to human existence does approach optimal design, that would suggest that in some completely unknown way, it may be the result of the functioning of physical and chemical laws for a brain that has reached a certain level of complexity. Uh, and further questions arise for general evolution um, that aren't novel, but have been somewhat at the margins of inquiry until recently. I'm thinking of work of Darcy Thompson and Alan Turing to mention two prominent figures. Well, perhaps I might add one final remark about the limits of understanding. Uh, many of the questions that uh, inspired the modern scientific revolution uh, are not even on the agenda of research. Uh, these include, crucially, issues that have to do with will and choice. Uh, they were taken to be at the core of the so-called mind-body problem. That is, the problem that was undermined by Newton when he showed that there were no bodies in any meaningful sense. Uh, there has been very valuable work about questions like, say, how an organism executes a plan for some integrated motor action. So how an organism, how a cockroach walks or a person reaches for a cup on the table. But no one even raises the question why this plan is executed rather than some other one, uh, apart from the uh, simplest organisms. Uh, and that's even true of the things that appear to be more or less passive, like, say, visual perception, sometimes thought of as a kind of reflexive, passive operation, though it really isn't. Uh, just recently, two well-known neuroscientists published a review of progress in solving a problem that was posed in 1850 by Helmholtz. Namely, even without moving our eyes, we can focus our attention on different objects at will, resulting in very different perceptual experiences of the same visual field. Uh, the phrase, at will, points to an area beyond serious empirical inquiry. It remains today as much of a mystery as it was for Newton at the end of his life. He was still then seeking some subtle spirit, as he called it, that lies hidden in all bodies and that might, without absurdity, account for their properties of attraction and repulsion, uh, the nature and effects of light, uh, sensation, and the way in which members of animal bodies move at the command of the will, all comparable mysteries for Newton, as they, many of them remain for us. Uh, in the 17th century, the ordinary use of language was taken to be the prime illustration of this mystery, 
and for reasons we should not lightly dismiss. Well, for some of these mysteries, uh, quite extraordinary bodies of doctrine have been developed in the past several hundred years, some of the greatest achievements of the human intellect, and there have been some remarkable feats of unification as well, quite surprising ones. Uh, how remote the remaining mountain peaks may be, and even just where they are, uh, we can only guess. Uh, within the range of feasible inquiry, there's plenty of work to be done in understanding mental aspects of the world that includes human language, and the prospects are surely exciting, uh, but we would do well to keep in some corner of our minds uh, David Hume's conclusion about nature's ultimate secrets and the obscurity in which they ever did and will remain, and particularly the reasoning that led him to that judgment and its confirmation and the subsequent history of the hard sciences. These are matters that are sometimes too easily forgotten, I suspect, and that merit serious reflection and possibly someday uh, even constructive scientific inquiry.